this computer. Yeah, so my name's Kate and um, I'm a teacher because I love craniosacral therapy. Um, the reason I teach this work is because in 1984, I went out to Oregon and I knew I wanted to be a practitioner and use my hands. And I was grew up in Amherst, so I was into alternative medicine. And uh, I got to school and I was extremely stressed. Chiropractic school is like trying to get a drink of water out of a, a, a fire hydrant. So it's not an easy training. And, you know, you're taking like classes from nine to five and um, cadaver lab and all that stuff. And I was 21 years old and I uh, was just in school with like people who had PhDs in chemistry that were doing a second career. And some of the people were physical therapists already from uh, Switzerland. And um, I went in to see an upper classmate because we had a clinic at school where when you're starting out, you would see the older the students that had, or were ahead of you so they could work on you before they worked on the public. So I went to see my friend that I had met who had actually known people that I knew back in Northampton. And I lay down on the table and I was kind of feeling pretty overwhelmed. It was like the first or second week of school. And uh, she just held my head for a while. I didn't know what she was doing. And after about 20 minutes, she was done. I said, what was that? I feel so much better. I feel so much calmer. I feel like the calmest I felt in like a month after moving here and starting a new program and stuff. And she said, oh, that's craniosacral therapy. So from that moment on, I was like, oh, this is why I came all the way out to Oregon so I could get that session, get this training in chiropractic, which I, you know, chiropractic is good, but it's not my true love. My true love is craniosacral and biochem. I like, I like nutrition. And uh, I started studying in school. We had a club, but it was a real life-changing moment for me because I didn't necessarily know that there was something that could help me feel that settled and uh, kind of... Um, calm amidst a lot of stress because I grew up in a big family with six kids I have four older brothers I'm the youngest and so my childhood was pretty pretty busy pretty active which is really fun I mean my brothers are a lot of fun my sister was fun but it was like non-stop go 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 and so when you have those early imprints in your nervous system from your upbringing you have to go somewhere else to learn how to feel calm and craniosacral was the thing that did that um so that's why i became a teacher also in school um i found it to be kind of flat like it was very biomechanical which is good you need that background very uh science-based um you know, all the basic sciences and then all the clinical sciences and all that good stuff. But it was like, come on, there's more stuff to the body than this. There's other layers to it that I'm feeling that they're not talking about. And craniosacral includes those. So it includes the whole system, the energetic body, and it includes, um, emotional regulation and the nervous system. So we're going to talk about all that. It is the labor of love, this work. So I call it the labor of love, this work. I love this work. It's it's never boring. It's um, <clears throat> It changes you as you give sessions. It changes you as well along with it. And it's primarily about these two things. So what we call primary respiration, which is not airway breathing, but energy breathing through 
your body. Your body, if it didn't have primary respiration, we would be cadavers, basically. We would just be like a body that doesn't have something activating our body into a human being. And a lot of modalities don't really talk about this. They just talk about the body. They talk about the anatomy. They talk about the organs and the systems. But we talk about this primary respiration. The other thing that I love about this work is that we talk about relational field safety. So that's like a big bunch of words that means how to settle your own nervous system so that you can help other people do that and help them feel safe and calm, just like my friend did in Oregon in school in 1984. And, you know, a lot of healing that people undergo, it's not just the technique. A lot of it is about how you connect with the therapist. And so this addresses that. If the therapist is somebody that you trust and you feel safe with, and it could be really subtle. It's not like safe, like, oh, no, I'm going down the wrong street in New York City and this is not safe. This is just like, is this somebody I would want to open up to? Is this somebody I would want to talk about what I'm noticing in my body or what's happening with me? Is this somebody that I trust that feels like they can hold that? Um, because sometimes things come up during sessions. So when there is that safety, basically people tend to trust more and then they can heal. They can drop into these deeper states of being and uh, connect in with their own autonomic nervous system balance. And, you know, people have heard about the social nervous system and the polyvagal nervous system, but we would learn all about that. And this is new stuff since I was in school. They didn't even, actually, when I took my cranial training, my biodynamic training <clears throat> back in 2001. I had taken Upledger in like 1986, Upledger cranial. And that was more mechanistic. And then I took my biodynamic training, which is the kind of work that I teach. So it's like a different, you have judo and then you have like karate. So I took karate early on and then I studied. It's a lot like that, so... Um, so that pretty much, uh, is the basis of the training are those two parts. And so, um, let's move this over here, maybe. So the relational field, just starting to cover that, it's just about relationship. It's a fancy way of saying, I'm sure people haven't heard of relational field. That's like a funny way of saying things, but it's about relationship with yourself and with other people. And so when you're giving sessions, I imagine that some of you are really sensitive people and tend to like notice what other people are feeling or you're feeling pretty good. And then you walk into a room and you're like, whoa, all of a sudden I feel this tension in my system, I didn't have that before. You're probably a highly sensitive person and you're picking up what other people are feeling. I didn't learn that till I was, you know, an adult, but it makes a lot, it made a lot of sense. So that relational field, you can actually help people by optimizing this, learning how to optimize that. And you can help your family, your friends, your pets, everybody. And you tune into what's happening with you, what's happening with the person. You orient to the midline. Uh, the midline or mid space is a place in your body that doesn't carry imprints. It's all health. It's all blueprint. It's all perfection. So there's a place in your body that isn't sick or isn't damaged or isn't injured. You can call it the mid space. 
You can also orient to your body, your tissue, your fluids, the potency, the energy flowing through your body. Primary respiration, which is like an energy breath. Uh, start to get to know your system when it speeds up, when it slows down, how to bring it back down. When we're at a high speed all the time, it makes us sick because then we don't notice what we're feeling. And cancer, things like cancer are basically like there's a part of your body that wasn't feeling something. That's how it starts is the body gets disconnected to an area and then it starts to dysfunction. And um, it's not like the cause of cancer is that the cause of cancer is toxins in the environment and EMFs and pesticides and plastics and all that stuff. And I don't want to be a Katie Downer, but that's the root of cancer. But if we're not aware of our body, we're not going to go, something's off here. Something isn't working right. I'm going to go check this out and see what's going on. A lot of people that have cancer had to shut down part of their system to function, to get through the day and not feel so that they could um, get through their job or their relationships or whatever they're dealing with. So this kind of helps you become more aware of your body and your mind. And we call it PEMSER, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, energetic, and relational. So we start to learn about those different layers name them, know what they are. So you don't just learn a technique that you do on other people when you take this training. You actually learn a technique that you do on yourself and then you take it and you share it with other people. So it's you're included in the practice. It's not like you go and you do massage or you go and you learn to do chiropractic. You actually learn it through your own body because the beauty of it is that you have a body so you can find your elbow, you can find your ulnar bone, you can find your phalanx, you know, you got one. Yeah. So we learn anatomy. I have an anatomy class that I pre-recorded that for students that haven't taken it before. And it kind of interrelates with the cranial work, which is great. Um. And that's required if you haven't taken any classes or you can also, you don't have to do my class. You can take an online class or, um, but that you do need to know anatomy, not, not like a doctor, not like a chiropractor, not like a PT, but you know, you do need to know what the sacrum is and um, you know, where the stomach is. And we do cover it in class as well, but, you don't want that to be the first time you've heard what the sacrum is. You want that to, you want to have heard about the sacrum before. Um, and then, yeah, so regulating your nervous system in relationship to other people, that's a big part because if you can do that, then they're going to go into regulation themselves. And when the nervous system is in regulation, you're tapping the healing part of the body. You can't really heal when you're going really fast. When I had a practice in New York City, I used to work on a lot of dancers and, um, you know, they're just, New York is fast. I don't know if any of you have been there much, but it's a fast place and you have to keep up the pace and, they would get on the table, we'd start a session and all of a sudden their stomach would start gurgling and they'd be like, oh, wow, I didn't even know I was hungry. That's their parasympathetic nervous system finally coming to the forefront and saying, hey, I need some more sleep or I need to eat something. But they've been, because in New York City, it's very sympathetic nervous system they're kind of going at a fast pace that other part of the nervous system doesn't get much of attention. So you have to kind of go out of your way to do that in places like that, to bring your, bring your autonomics back to the parasympathetic orientation. 
and you befriend your nervous system by uh, understanding what it's doing and naming what it's doing in your body. Like, oh, I feel tingling in my feet or um, oh, I'm getting like a lot of heat coming up or um, speeding up or just different things like that. So you do have to have a little bit of self-regulation and co-regulation to take the training. So, you know, if people are on a lot of mental health meds and that's what they need to stabilize, which I have no judgment about, you probably, this wouldn't be a good match to be in this training because you do need to have a little bit of regulation, self-regulation in place to be able to stabilize yourself. You're coming into a group of 12 to 16 students and sometimes we're talking about experiences that people had when they were little and your body might remember that and you know you have to do a little bit of work around it or get some support around it so that's important that's important to to know but people heal when they're in a safe relationship when they feel safe that's when they heal and not to be so blatant but you know if we were in the ukraine not feeling very safe right now it would be hard to access safety in a place that's at war so it's very important to know what it means to be safe and how how that's experienced and also one of the one of the things to know about yourself is to learn about your shadow, your own shadow. Everybody's got a shadow. If they say they don't, they're probably not aware of it, but everyone has one. It's good to start to learn about it because that starting to understand your shadow will also help you be a better practitioner. So the more we do that work, on our own system, the safer holding field we have for our clients. I'm sure some of you may have been to practitioners where you feel super, super safe and you're like, wow, this is great. Like, I really feel comfortable with that person. You know, I want to go back. And then you've been to other practitioners that, you know, you're sitting there waiting for them to see you in the exam room and they come in, they don't even introduce themselves. They start doing things and asking you to do things. You don't even know who they are. You know, that may not make you feel so safe, right? That could be activating. So this is more the other model of, of care. And a big piece is differentiating from what you're feeling from what your client's feeling because when you're holding someone's spine or their feet you're going to feel stuff in their body field body mind system and you need to know that it's not yours and stay clear about that and that's a lot of the training is that and so you want to meet people where they are like i would meet an engineer with from MIT in a certain way versus someone who is a Reiki practitioner or a yoga instructor. So you meet them where they are and then you offer them an option to open up and go to this place maybe or this place. Some of that's verbal and some of that's nonverbal. You know, right now I have a patient who's a CFO of a company certified financial plan uh, boss he's the boss <laughs> and he is thinking a lot and he's in charge of a lot of people so when I work with him we work on helping him become more aware of his body and what he's noticing in his body and what he's feeling whereas someone who is a a uh, massage therapist they probably have a good sense of that already and you know we're not doing that work as much we're just helping them 
magnifying the tides in their system, which we're going to talk about in just a second. And the mind body naturally goes wide. That's our natural state of being. I don't know if any of you have any pets, but they're in that space all the time. They're in that wider perceptual field. And then I have two dogs and then they, they hear something, they're a little alarm system, and then they get narrow. But generally they're pretty wide in their focus, which is our natural state. And so when we're working with people, the the orientation of where they their concentration is where their focus is changes throughout the session and so we learn to know what those changes are what they look like and we support those changes and one of the ways we know that the nervous system is more you know in balance is you can test it with something called heart rate variability and they have little Devices that, you know, clip onto our earlobe where the vagus nerve comes out and you can measure the heart rate variability and the higher the heart rate variability, the more health the person tends to have. Most disease is related to autonomic nervous system imbalances. Um, biodynamic really helps regulate the nervous system touch when we make contact with people it increases oxytocin and oxytocin tends to down regulate diminish cortisol and cortisol causes people lots of trouble it's related to hypertension high blood sugar diabetes stress you know all those fun things And so when we're giving a session, it's like being at a, a concert where you're listening to different instruments and you're learning about the cello and the viola and the, the uh, upright bass and the um, violin and uh, French horn, things like that. So you're learning to name those different parts. And so that when you're in a session, you can start to name those things and you know what you're listening to. It's a very different way of listening to the body. We learn about resources. This is one of my resources. These days, you know, you, if you're on Instagram and stuff, they call this a glimmer. This is a hot chocolate lava cake, one of my favorite desserts. Dark chocolate, of course. So it's good to know what your resources are, things that you think of, you get a smile on your face, you're like, oh yeah, I love that cake. You could feel it in your body, you could feel it outside your body. This is another big resource of mine, are dogs and beaches, and trees. It's really important to start to orient to resources because there's so much like orientation, the way we're wired in our brains to orient towards suffering. How was your day? Oh, it was bad, bad, bad. And then the last thing is something good, maybe, or not even. And it wasn't even that bad of a day, right? That's just how our left brain, we're left brain culture. And um, the left brain is critical, narrow. And so resources kind of helps Oh yeah, like that tree has been there for 50 years. Look how beautiful it is. The tree's okay, you know. We learn the tides. This is a really cool artist, Alex Gray. And he's not a craniosacral therapist, but he, honestly, he did mushrooms. <laughs> and I think he smoked a lot of pot. And that's how he uh, drew these, made these incredible paintings of basically what we talk about. This picture right here is a depiction of the long tide, how it connects us. It's kind of like the World Wide Web, connects us to the earth and the sky. Um, it's a very stable uh, tide to orient to. It's very healing. And then in this picture, this person has the chakra system here 
And this is called the biosphere in craniosacral. And this is, it's also called the fluid body. And um, this area um, basically is where the mid tide expresses itself in this zone. So these are the main tides. They're called tides. They're energy breaths that we track in people's systems. And we go back and forth. When they show up, when these tides show up, it means the person is getting resourced. They don't always show up in sessions because the person isn't able to settle enough to drop into this deep, deep state of accessing these healing tides. So we try to really support that settling into that deep, deep state so they can access this. And then when they leave our treatment room, they can go out and expand that into their life and access these healing, supportive energy breaths and check in with them throughout the day. And that's what I do. I walk my dogs every day or hike or bike. And I try to kind of tune into these tides when I'm doing those things, like a meditation. So here's a, another picture. This is our version of Alex Gray's drawing. Um, the first layer we don't really work with, it's called the cranial rhythmic impulse. And it's very much in the tissue and it's it's got a faster pace. And that's what Upledger worked and other types of cranial work orient to. What we orient to more is the body and this brown zone here, the mid tide, and beyond that into the long tide. So here you can see it's kind of blurry, but there are, you know, it's like a Russian doll. There's there's energy fields within energy fields within energy fields. So this is the physical body. This is the fluid body, which is also called the fluid tide or the mid tide. And this is the tidal body, which is also called the long tide. Yeah. And then the chakras come off of this system. The chakras come off of the midline. And the chakras go way, 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 way back, way before Western medicine to times of Ayurveda and Tibetan medicine you know, 5,000 years old Chinese medicine, localized energy centers along the midline. We learn to connect with people energetically. So this is a nice, clear, you know, um, well-defined, well-boundaried field versus this is a little bit too far back and this is a little bit too close in. And these can have different effects on our clients. So we learn about that. Um, yeah, and as you go through a training, basically you kind of, I'll just openly say it. They didn't tell me this when I took my training back in 2001, but you get healed too. And you do a lot of work on your own system. And we really, really, really try and support that as a team. you kind of learn how to take care of yourself better these with what's happening these days. And it'll, it will highlight, you know, the training will highlight where things are stuck. You know, sometimes when we talk about in my class, we're talking about early, early embryology. Some of the students, they just fall asleep and I don't take it personally, but something that they went through is coming up for them and so you know as a team we're aware of that or we're talking about something a little later like you know a 25 year old situation you know in the body and something will come up so wherever you have any imprints imprints are kind of like dents in your energy field that you've had to deal with and the body deals with dents really well, but, um, you know, the blueprint, imprint blueprint. So the blueprint is when the car is in perfect shape, it's brand new, no dents, but life happens, right? And those dents make us a lot more interesting. It's not like we're not supposed to have dents. They make us have a lot more depth and compassion. And it's not like we're supposed to get rid of them. We just kind of, um, 
know, get to know them and include them. So we don't like say, oh, we're going to make that go away. That's kind of a simplistic way to talk about it, but um, yeah. And the relational field safety is, is, is the first part of the training. It's really important for students. It also includes the team and it includes the teachers. It's not like, um, you know, the students have to just be safe with each other. Everybody in the room needs to feel safe. And so when things arise, that means, you know, people need support around that and that everybody's included. And yeah, most, the, the key point is that most of our wounding is relational. It was in relationship to another human being, or it was something that happened to us physically that got coupled with a relational wound. So maybe somebody had a car accident and nobody stopped. I had a patient like this. She had a bike accident and nobody stopped to help her. So what happens? Trust in humankind, right? And then the accident. So you got to treat both things. You can't just treat the accident. So when I was working with her, I said, oh my goodness, that must have been just really rough on you. I'm so sorry that happened. And then we worked with resourcing and kind of like letting her system know that not everybody is like that. Not everybody would just drive by, you know? And, um, oh, the other layer to that story was that a dog came out and um, she didn't know there was one of those fake, those uh, wires in the ground that kept the dog from crossing, but the dog was going after her <laughs> and she had broken her hip. So layers, right? There's layers of things and injuries and it's not just the injury. It's not just chiropractic or orthopedic or PT, you know, just that leg or hip broke or something like that if you treat the whole thing the results are going to last longer they're going to have less chronic problems from it early pre-verbal experiences are, are really important they're you know we're really close to our blueprint when we're babies and we can experience things that happen that are before we could talk and this work, one of the incredible things about this work is that it actually taps into this pre-verbal area and helps it heal. There isn't a lot of work that does that. And a lot of people from the somatic experiencing community like Kathy Kane and Stephen Terrell that teach body work with somatic experiencing are taking a lot of the concepts that we teach in biodynamic and combining it with SE to work with pre-verbal issues. And this is a, you know, just in case there's people that don't get this, I'd like to have a little bit of science because, you know, people um, sometimes, unless we live in the Northeast, let's admit it, most of us are from the Northeast. <laughs> so we have Harvard down the road, we have MIT, we have Smith, we have Mount Holyoke, Amherst. We got all these brainiacs. So sometimes we have to bring in these concepts, like even though we all probably know this, from conception to death, if a person goes through a difficult situation, maybe one of their parents is sick or something like that, it affects these issues if they're untreated. This is if they're untreated and affects their health. Yeah, so that's what we help people heal from through the body. We do it through the body, <laughs> sacral system. This is a real study. This is not woo-woo, as we say, woo-woo. My New Yorkers like that. My New York friends like the woo-woo thing. I'm married to a New Yorker. She's... She's taught me a lot. So inner body, outer body, social body. So the in utero child 
experiences what the mother experienced, what the family experiences, and actually builds their body and nervous system to, to meet that. So it's not just once you're born, it's actually before you're born, you're kind of preparing your nervous system and your body. And so now we're gonna go through like the team's background. Um, I love mountains. That's why I picked pick this picture. I'm a big mountain person. That's why I love Charlemont. There's a lot of, it's a little magical spot up here. Nobody really knows about it. It's kind of like out in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> hidden in Massachusetts. Um, my training, my formal training is chiropractor. And um, I've been practicing since 1988. And I, you know, I work with all kinds of things with people. Um, I really like teaching. My parents were teachers and two of my brothers are teachers. Um, I also practice genetic nutrition because sometimes people need support in a more, um, you know, concrete metabolic way. And I do energy muscle testing for diagnostic to help me diagnose what's happening with people through something called applied kinesiology. Now I did study and did uh, the basic upledger cranial and I, and I was also in a cranial club in school and I practiced that my first 10 years of practice, I did that kind of work. And then in 1919, what happened for me is I was doing uh, upledger work and I was like, okay, I'm feeling these other things. They're not talking about them. So I went to England I thought, oh, the Holy Grail is going to be in England and I'm going to take a class with osteopaths for chiropractors, PTs, osteos. So I went over there, I took a five-day class and it was really boring. It was all like good stuff, but boring. It was, um, you know, foramen holes in the skull and what nerves go through and what arteries go through. And it's like, yeah, 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 that's chiropractic school. And I've studied that a lot. And And then Michael Kern came in he's my teacher he's a british osteopath he has a school in england and he did a little talk for an hour and i just was like because in the human design i'm a projector and i could just feel his energy and i was like who that's the person that once once again it was like that's the person that i was supposed to see you know so i went up to him and i said hey are you going to teach in the States? I really want to study with you. And he said, well, as a matter of fact, I'll be teaching in Boston. And so I jumped for joy and uh, got in his class. And it was a real big life changer for me. Um, it just was just the perfect time after practicing to take his class. And I just, it was like, no, that's not all there is. There's all this other stuff that I'd been feeling that now I could understand what it was. And that was the tides, really. And also he he him he wrote a book called Wisdom in the Body. Um, but he also, like Franklin, the other guy who developed this work, are both into Buddhism. They're both Franklin was a monk for three years, Michael's Tibetan Buddhist. So they bring in a lot of uh, those concepts into the work. And then recently I took a course with uh, Bridget Vixen's called Alchemical Alignment Somatic Tools for Trauma, which was really great. And she kind of combines biodynamic cranial somatic experiencing and then her own pre and perinatal and just really creative spin on healing. And I'm working on a book um, kind of like uh, about clinical experiences and how they cross over with um, this work and other work I do, just stories. I think stories are fun to read because I'm half Irish, so I have to tell stories. <laughs> and Alexa is amazing. She is a polarity practitioner. She's um the other teacher she's an assistant teacher and 
She has studied a lot of yoga, polarity. She's uh, taught at the Rise School. And um, so she has a lot more of that energetic anatomy system background. Um, she's a massage therapist. She studied visceral manipulation. She studied up ledger. So she has a lot of, she also has a lot of clinical experience. She's been practicing, you know, since 1994. Debbie is my partner and she is the manager and she helps stabilize the class. She's just a really super stable person because she's worked in ORs most of her life. Um, she did interventional radiology, which is helping the doctors do science fiction and snaking things up people's arteries into their brain and helping people with strokes. And um, she's a, a big biker, bicyclist, and she is gonna be a city counselor in Northampton. And uh, she's also had cancer twice and healed from that. And um, so she carries a lot of experience around what it takes to heal and what it takes to um, do the work really. And then Steven is awesome. He is a biodynamic cranial therapist. He's really amazing with tracking things and relational field dynamics. And he's studied um, shamanic work and energy healing. He's uh, studied massage. He's just a new dad. He just had a baby, him and his wife, partner. He's a really nice addition to our team. And then we also have floaters, which are people, it's their first time assisting a training. Uh, we're gonna have, um, uh, Steph, who is a uh, psychotherapist who graduated from my training and does craniosacral a lot in her practice. And then a woman from Canada is going to come down and she recently graduated from a training and she's a massage therapist. So we're all registered uh, craniosacral therapists. So that means we went through the two-year training, 750-hour training. Now, the thing you need to understand is there's a lot of people who say they're biodynamic craniosacral therapists, but they took a weekend class. This is not a weekend class. It's a two-year, 750-hour training. There's 350 hours of class, and then there's um, 300 hours of practice sessions, homeworks, things like that. So... Just know when you see RCST, not just BCSD, biodynamic craniosacral therapist, that they went through the North American, the Biodynamic Craniosacral Therapy Association of North America. I know that is so much wording to say, but they list all the classes, all the, the teachers that have been approved and the practitioners that have graduated and things like that. Um, so yeah, we really want to create a safe, supportive container for students. There's only, there's one person for two tables and sometimes even one person per table to support you. So it's pretty cool. And since the class is going to be hybrid, partly the people that you know, that do not want to come in on the three days, there's going to be a person online to support in the breakout room on Zoom. The TAs read your homework. They provide support. They meet with you between modules and have little meetings to see how you're doing if you need any support. And so the structure of the training is that there's 12 modules. Um, and there's six three-day modules, and these can be taken in person or online. What I found with COVID is that, you know, things come up for people after COVID too. Their, their child is sick, or they're sick, or they're out of the country, or, you know, because it is a two-year training, so they can do part of it online. Um, 
and we do breakout rooms on Zoom and uh, the tech is really good. We're really teching up here on having two monitors in the room, one for the slides and presentations and one for the people on Zoom. And um, then there are six five-day modules. So these are three a year where you have to be in person in the group. And um, so it kind of cuts down on the travel. You know, I have some students that are in North Carolina. I have a bunch of students that are thinking of taking the training in California. I have some people in Hawaii that might be interested. So it's better for the environment too, because they're not, you know, flying here all the time and putting, uh, you know, f taking planes and trains and automobiles. And so the entire class, um, it's 10 to six. Lunch is generally one and a half to two hours. And um, online is for, you know, it's for every single three-day class, the in-person. But if you want, you can also just go to every class in person, which is totally fine. Um, and then the five days, those are three times a year. They're Wednesday through Sunday. They're generally 10 to six. We do have an Airbnb upstairs that a group of students can rent, but we can't, you know, if you just have to pay for the, the Airbnb rate, it sleeps, honestly, it sleeps up to 12 students. So, um, you know, there's also other Airbnbs around and sometimes people find a local friend and stay with a friend locally. And some people camp out in the summer because it's really pretty up here. There's a, like three state parks around here you can camp at. And we do have a shower. So if you did that and you want to come in and use the shower, we have a kitchen. You can use the kitchen if you want to bring your uh, camper park it in the parking lot and you can use the facilities here if you want to do it that way. Every morning we do meditations. They're so important. It's a great way to learn because I generally talk about what we're going to be talking about in lectures. And you're not having to like look at the notes and the slides and you can just like lie back and if you space out, no big deal or you go on a little journey on your own, but we record everything. We record the meditations, we record the lectures, we record the demos. Everything is on Google Drive. And recently I just put all my meditations. If you wanna hear some of my meditations, my students really like them, that's why I did it. Um, they're on SoundCloud under Divine Structure and they're free, you can just, Listen to them one day. Movement's really important because, you know, we do have to go over anatomy. We do have to go over concepts of the polyvagal nervous system and things like that. And so it's really good around here. Like you can just, there's a little, I live next to a, a tennis court and basketball court. So you can go there. You can walk across the field to the river and hang out there. It's just, uh, we're just surrounded by nature. Um, so it's really good to move between um, break at breaks and get some movement in because there is some sitting, you know, sometimes the lectures take a while. Uh, so year one is really about stabilization as Bridget Vixen says, uh, relational field safety, the mid tide, the mid tide is very stabilizing tide. So learning to feel that self stabilization, like how to slow your nervous system down so you can feel more of these things. The holistic shift, that's something that you'll learn about. That's something that Franklin named. They have different names for it. You'll find there's a lot of things, a lot of modalities doing the same things but they're using different words. So they're using the word glimmer instead of resource. 
or they're using holistic shift versus zero point field or, you know, there's a lot of crossover. The ritual of contact, that's how you start a session. The midline, mid space. Verbal skills, like how to speak with the person on the table. Augmenting, aug augmenting space. Uh, uh, when you're working with somebody, augmenting a bone breathing better, augmenting um, a, a exhalation still point or an inhalation still point, inherent treatment plan, kind of following along what the person system is showing you, noticing the long tide, noticing dynamic stillness. So that's year one. It's just like, just kind of like the real overview wholeness of the work. And then the second year is more specific. So learning about the nervous system specificity, the birth process. We just did the face and the jaw in, uh, in my class um, a couple weeks ago. Yeah, so a little bit more specific. And we learn a lot of nervous system balancing and trauma skills. Not enough to be a trauma therapist, but we are trauma informed. So, you know, if somebody has really intense trauma and they really need a lot of support, it's really important that they go get some support with somebody who's like trained in mental health. And But we do have like really good basic sp skills more than more than any other body worker, honestly. Um, and the reason is sometimes ancestral and general generational stuff comes up pre and perinatal birth, you know, societal BIPOC racial stuff, LGBTQ, IA stuff, attachment issues, developmental issues, complex PTSD, PTSD, you know, all that stuff that people have that they come in with that and sometimes you bump into it when you're working with people and you don't realize it's there and then you do something and it can really activate them so it's important to recognize what that is and how to work with it so how do how we meet sympathetic fight flight freeze dissociation you know creative opposition, which is how to discharge some of that out of the body. And anatomy, physiology, neurobiology, embryology, clinical. Um, the clinical part is great because Alexa and I have a lot of experience, so we can bring in stories about our practice and what it's like out there. You know, some teachers don't really have much of a practice, like they are teaching already and they haven't practiced much. That's the beauty of this training is like, we've been out there doing it. And so we really know what it's like to be working in the field. And if you start talking about the holistic shift and things with your clients, they're going to start to space out and be like, what is she talking about? What are they talking about? Like they are out there, right? So it's got like a whole new language, which is kind of frustrating. I, I One of the things I like to try to do in my training is like make it more simple without so much jargon, you know? The holding field's really important. And that's, that's the energy that the team holds for stability for the class. Because we're tracking the energy of the, the class. We're tracking the students, how they're doing emotionally physically, mentally, all those things, and offering support. And there's one of my, I think that was my second class. This will be my fifth, my sixth class training I'm teaching. This is my second one. Here I'm doing a demo on the spine. And now this is a couple weeks ago. I'm sh I'm uh, showing doing a demo on Maui Lisa, one of my students, on Zoom and in person 
on how to work in the mouse and work on the TMJ. And so how we support learning. It's multidimensional. We try to have slides. We try to have um, experiences that we do in the class, the meditations, movement, um, kinesthetic, you know, doing things with holding things and like holding a sheet to experience the fascia and working with that like a literal bed sheet, having a group of people hold a bed sheet and experience fascia. Uh, it's analogous to fascia. Um, breakout groups within the class to like look at the movements of the bones, work in little groups and people hold the bones and move them. Hands-on support at the table is really good, but also in the breakout room, having a TA with you right there on Zoom. Also, we do three feedback sessions where you work on somebody on the team during the training and um, ask where you need support, and then they can give you feedback on the different holds or how you held the space, things like that. And open exploration. So just letting the students just openly explore after the lecture with different holds we taught, what that feels like. So it's not like you're going to be forced to do this and this, right? Have you ever been in a class where you're supposed to be doing this during the exploration and then this is happening? It's completely different. Yeah, we allow that because we don't make you go back to, it's like we go with what's happening what's on the table and then we help you support around that. We're almost done. I know this is a long one, but the feedback sessions are great. Can you see in the picture, the, the mountains and the reflection? So it's just a big reflection. And when we have somebody who's had a lot of work done on themselves, give you feedback on what they're noticing and how the contact is, you're gonna learn so much more from that than anything else really, than any lecture. So it's really powerful. TA groups are great because not everybody wants to like check in personally or ask questions in a larger group. It can be intimidating. So we split the, the class into smaller groups so that they can kind of check in with each other. Um, I want to make sure everybody made it here if anybody needs to check in here. Um, yeah, nobody needs to check in. Okay. So the TA groups are great. I always liked them because I never wanted to, in my class, I never wanted to share in the larger group. I was intimidated. So I liked it when it was a smaller group. And then you have little check-ins between modules. And the group of students stays the same, the whole class. So you can get some buddies and connections there. And then uh, you switch team members that lead the group. So it's nice to get to know a different team member. And that's the person for that time that checks your homework. A peer group meeting is done on Saturdays and that's, uh, it's a two hour lunch and that's where you guys have your own meeting without us there. And we leave the school and just, you can just do whatever you want with the meetings and share ideas and see how you're doing and maybe figure out how to connect with each other outside of um, class if you want to, or just get support and get to know each other more. There's study, you can do study groups between modules. You can, um, you know, connect with your small group TA between modules. Like, hey, I just had this thing happen. What was that? Or can I talk to you about this? You know, people are happy to connect with you. Um, you know, if it starts to be like a weekly thing or more than 15 or 20 minutes, you should pay them for their time because you know, they're busy people. You can create your own group on Google if you want or Slack or something else, whatever you want to, to way to connect with each other. 
mighty people are using mighty now and i am going to start connecting people with alumni because you do have to get 10 sessions so you know who went through the training and honestly if you want to ask alumni people who graduated what the training was like what they thought i'm happy to share that list as well yep we meet online once once between each module and we use um, Google. Yeah, we have homework. I didn't want to give too much homework. There's reading and there's two practice sessions a week. And then you write up two of the sessions. And then I just do a quiz. Now the quiz, don't worry about the quiz. It's kind of silly. There's a lot of silly jokey questions on it. So it's kind of fun. And it's not meant to show, you know, what you don't know or anything. It's more to make sure you're kind of up to speed with what we talked about the module for, for before. And um, we go through it in the class. It's not graded or anything. You just have it. You only know the answers. And it just helps you kind of get a sense of where you are at and what you might want to brush up on particularly in the anatomy and um, um, polyvagal nervous system stuff. Google Drive, that's where everything is stored. So you can connect to Google Drive from your phone, from your iPad, from your um, laptop, from your computer. You just download the app on those things. Um, you know, there is a Google Drive app and so everything's all in one place. So you don't have to print everything out and waste paper unless you want to. Of course you can. Everything's recorded. And we throw in some articles that are great to read. And here's the reading. There's my teacher, Michael Kern. I was telling you about from England, the British guy. This is a great book. Uh, Franklin Sills. This is a textbook. So we do most of the reading from this because there's no way you could sit down and read this book. It's like trying to read, you know, like a chemistry book or something. But these two books you could sit down and read, especially Michael's. Very fun to read. Peter Levine's work on trauma and Deb Dana's work. She works with... Um, uh, Stephen Porges. She's got a lot of great stuff. Dr. Deutsch, Bruce Lipton, Roland Becker. So all of these are books that you'd want to have for the training. This one, um, I give a copy to you because it's out of print. So, and I know Michael's book, you can get really inexpensively used. Um, and, uh, you could start reading it now. It would give you a real good sense of the class. So to graduate, you have to do 150 practice sessions. So that's about two sessions a week. In the beginning, it's like 20 minutes. Just put your hands on somebody's shoulders. See what you feel. Um, in the end, it's more like try the liver hold or, you know, Try an ignition at the uh, the heart chakra or something like that. Receive 10 sessions from a registered craniosacral therapist. Uh, finish your homework, which is basically writing up those sessions. And then there's two projects. There's a, um, a clinical project, which is basically um, you give one person 10 sessions either once a week or at least every two weeks. You do this the second half of the training. You write up their history, just like you would in practice. And then what happened each session, it doesn't have to be a lot, it could be like a paragraph. And then at the end, write up what they noticed changed, what you noticed changed, if anything, and you know what that was like for you. There's also a cranial nerve project because the cranial nerves are really important and they're going to start getting more and more information about how important they are. And this is for you to have a reference. And I also share my cranial nerve project that I did like 22 years ago. 
Um, so, you know, you can use, you can get as extensive as you want or keep it really simple. Depends on your personality, I guess. And then the final exam is a take home exam. It's an open book exam. And if there are people that are neurodivergent, you know, we can help you with that. Um, but basically it's all from the notes and, um, you know, it's all open books. So it's not um, rigorous or anything like that. But it's a great way to kind of, we go through it in the last class. So it's a great way to know, learn things. Sometimes like some things get put together that you didn't know because they're said in a certain way. And no, you don't have to wear those graduation outfits. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, and then 10, 10 sessions. And there's the cranial nerve project. This is a funny little picture of the cranial nerves. And graduation, we have a disco ball actually in our in our classroom right behind my desk here. And that's that's going to stay up. I put it up for my 60th birthday party a couple weeks ago. So that's here. So we are going to have the disco ball. And um, you can, you know, students do a lot of fun things at the graduation. They basically create their own ceremony and we can do whatever they want. It's really fun. Fun day. And we have a community starting. So, you know, this will be my sixth training and uh, you can connect with grads and I want to do like a, my students talked about a rest, restival. So I want to do a restival where graduates come and work on each other and uh, students can come and meet the grads and do trades and stuff like that. Um, get supervision from practitioners, volunteer your time. I do want to do a baby clinic up here at some point a low cost clinic. And uh, the trainings for everybody, it's for practitioners that already have another modality that want to deepen and do something at a modality. It's for uh, cranial therapists that want to switch from mechanical to biodynamic. It's for um, people wanting to expand their verbal skills, perceptual skills deepen a relationship with primary respiration. Here's a big one. And these people are great. Heart-centered people wishing to be of service to the world. Don't have to be a practitioner. Could be a bookkeeper. You really don't have to be a practitioner um, beforehand. And so wanting to heal themselves and other people, do some deep transformational work on yourself, and also, you know, sometimes clients really have profound experiences and they're like, I really want to learn more about this. I love this stuff. And I don't know if I'm going to be in practice or not, but I want to study this. Anatomy, I got a pre-recorded class and that's on my website as well. Or you can take a class somewhere. And there's our sign, Debbie and I, we did this sign this year, finally and Charlemont, and uh, there's the last class. I was given a, some support to these students doing a trade. So this is what the space looks like. And there's Alexa and I, and we have, I didn't realize this, but we have 63 years of in practice experience between us. It's pretty wild when you think of it that way. So I'm gonna um, switch over just to see if anybody